The first scripture reading this morning is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, and you can find that on page 208 in the New Testament. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed with me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second reading is from Luke 15, verses 1 through 10, and that can be found on page 78 of the New Testament. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees near, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, "This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them." So he told them this parable: Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost? until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of the Lord. Each of us has a story, many stories, in fact. We have our sort of our full life story, right? And then we have these many stories that make up that one big life story. The stories of something that has happened, stories about something we've experienced, stories about someone we have met. The young boy sitting next to me at Nationals Park on Friday night has a story. He was about 10 years old, and he used to be a Phillies fan, and the Nationals were playing the Phillies. But now he's a Nationals fan, because he can see the Nationals on TV. And he and his family have never been to a Major League Baseball game. Never. They've never been in any Major League Baseball park. I didn't get the sense that his dad was really interested that much in baseball, but here they were, mom, dad, and a little 10-year-old. So at the beginning of the game, before the game begins, the teams are warming up on the field, And then there's the Star Spangled Banner and the first pitch and all of that. Well, as the teams were coming in from warming up, before the Star Spangled Banner, before the first pitch, the opening pitch, 
this young boy somehow caught the attention of Ian Desmond, who is the shortstop for the Washington Nationals. And he was, my, the, my little friend was sitting down, and we weren't really far up, but far enough away, and I wasn't sure if Desmond would see him. I wasn't sure sort of what was happening, and I had on a bright green blouse, and I thought, I'll get his attention. So I stood up, and I was waving my arms. I don't think I needed to do anything because there was a laser beam between Ian Desmond and this boy. And Ian Desmond took the ball and threw it right to him. And the boy lifted up his mitt and caught the ball. It was fantastic. <laughs> and I turned to the dad and I said, this never happens. <laughs> But we know that that boy is going to be telling that story the rest of his life. How about you? Think about a moment in your own life story. How have you gotten to where you are now? And those of you who are younger, you have a shorter path to consider, and yet an important path just the same. Children and young people, think about your journey too. Who are the teachers you have had? Or the sports teams that you have been a part of? Or instruments you have played? Or places where you've lived? Friends you've had? Hobbies you have pursued? Places you've been? All of these make up your story. The story of your life. So how about you? What's your story? And how does your story fit into that larger story of God's love for the world in Jesus Christ? Part of the reason that we do church, part of the reason that we are here as a community of faith, part of the reason that we gather each Sunday with other Christians is to worship and to praise God, to hear the story of God's love for the world in Jesus Christ. And to find our place within that story. It's here, when you and I are gathered with the baptized, that our own personal story finds meaning within that larger story of God's people. It is here, when we are gathered with the baptized, that we remember that your story and my story, while they are unique, our stories are not isolated. Ours, rather, are part of a larger, grander story of God's people and God's ways in the world. Today, in Paul's letter to Timothy, we hear just a bit about how the Apostle Paul puts his own story within this larger meta-narrative of God's love for the world in Jesus Christ. Now, we might know the story of Paul's conversion from the book of Acts, Paul tells us, remember he wrote, he was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. Now a blasphemer is somebody who dishonors God, somebody who reviles God, somebody who shows contempt for God. Now I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to put the Apostle Paul and blasphemer into the same sentence. They just don't work. But somehow Paul saw himself as a blasphemer. Perhaps he saw his persecution of early Christians as blasphemy, as dishonoring and reviling the work of God in Jesus Christ. Remember that Paul was zealous, zealous for bringing Christians to judgment for the way that they, to Paul's way of thinking, distorted and dishonored the Torah. Now the stakes were high for early Christians. They could be maimed, they could be tortured, they could be put to death because of their profession in Jesus Christ. And that is still true in parts of the world today. So Paul was one who terrorized those early Christians. And Jesus Christ showed him mercy. Paul welcomes us into his story through these places of sin, 
so that we might see this expanse of God's mercy. And we might see that that same mercy is big enough, broad enough, compassionate enough to embrace even us. Paul tells his story. And in the telling, you and I might see glimpses of our own story. Now, often, stories of conversion are dramatic. Paul's is certainly one of those. Others might be that from drug and alcohol addiction, somebody becomes clean and sober. Or from living a wretched style of life that was disrespectful of everyone else to being a generous and humble spirit. Now, I dare say that there are very few of us in this room who have such dramatic testimony. Some of us do, but most of us do not. As I've listened to you, as I ponder my own conversions, I've learned that most of our stories of conversion are on a gentler slope, not quite so dramatic. That at some point in our lives, maybe at many points in our lives, we have recognized that God's love is meant for us. And that love and that mercy penetrates into those dark places of guilt and wandering. And God's love and God, God's mercy penetrates into those dark places of suffering and brokenness. We might name it the presence of God. We might name it the mercy of Jesus Christ. But there is something about the reality of God's love in Jesus Christ that has interrupted our lives precisely at that point where things have a hold on us. And we realize that life is different because of that penetrating love and mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Now, it might be that the change in us is not dramatic, except in our own understanding. As we begin to see our own stories held within the embrace of this Meta narrative of God's love for the world in Jesus Christ. So, with the assurance then of that embrace, we can then really be honest with ourselves and honest with one another, allowing God's healing and redeeming love to continue to penetrate into even more and other dark corners of our lives. And whether we think that our conversions are dramatic or not, the gospel story today reassures us that there is joy in heaven with each one. Joy. Paul's story helps us to see what is possible. This is who Paul is. Paul is a blasphemer. Paul is a, Paul is a man of violence. And there's room in the gospel for him. Well, gosh, maybe, maybe there's room in the gospel for you and me as well. Now, Paul can preach and he can write about the doctrine of death and resurrection. He can write about the doctrine of sin and redemption. He can write about the doctrine of forgiveness and grace, the doctrine of sanctification and new life. Doctrine is one thing, but it's Paul's story that hooks us. It's his story. His story illustrates the truth. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, he writes, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinner, sinners. Paul's story animates that truth and makes it more than just an idea. Paul's story makes it real. Our stories animate that same truth. Our stories make that truth real. One of the powerful aspects of our Christ Care groups is the ways in which our stories help one another grow in faith. In sharing together in a small group, we get to know one another. And those of you who are in Christ Care groups know this dynamic. How one person's story 
of how God brought strength, enabling that person to make it through a rough patch in the week, that story opens up a possibility for another person in the group. One person's story opens up the possibility that God really does come to us in strength and in perseverance and in insight and imagination and in patience and in discipline. One story opens up the possibility and allows another to ask, well, gosh, what if the world were like this? Giving them a new alternative. Think about the power of our stories beyond our Christ care groups, beyond our own community of faith, people that you and I know, people we know in our lives, our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, our teammates, our schoolmates. These are people that we know who are yearning for love that embraces them as they are. They are yearning for a grace that forgives even their most foolish, their most evil deeds. They are yearning for a hope that will draw them forward beyond ordinary human flourishing. We know that they yearn for it because we yearn for it. And we're really not all that different from each other. Did you ever consider that your stories have the power to inspire? Did you ever consider that your stories have the capacity to open up an alternative future for another person? You and I ought never to underestimate how God will use our stories to awaken and deepen faith for another. Our stories don't need to be dramatic to draw others in, but they do have to be honest and authentic. We don't have to convert others to the truth of the gospel. We do not have to explain the doctrines of Christian faith. All we have to do is recognize God's activity in our lives and then simply tell the story. Honestly, tell the story. Now we might have to let our guard down just a little bit honestly relaying our own vulnerabilities or fears or our waywardness or our impatience or our brokenness. When we say to another, I know what you're going through. And this is what happened to me. Paul tells his story to inspire and to encourage Timothy to encourage him to stand firm in the gospel. Because others around Timothy and that early church were teaching half-truths. And so Paul tells his own story to encourage Timothy to teach the whole truth, the whole truth of the gospel. He gives his testimony, Paul gives his testimony, not to draw attention to himself. He gives his testimony so that Timothy might be strengthened. He says, here, Timothy, this is what I know. This is who I was, chief of sinners. And I know the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. God will put opportunities in our path, opportunities to tell our stories of how God has strengthened us, of how we have grown in faith, about how we have been encouraged by the community of faith, of how we have come to the knowledge that this love is meant for us. You and I have nothing to fear when those opportunities land in our lap. Because God has already given us the words to say, God has already given us the actions to do because they come from our own heart. They come from our own lives. So how about you? What's your story? The word of the Lord.